I think that we need to have a different perspective altogether is really, I think, where any kind of real change in your immediate happens is whenever you change your perspective. And that's really what we get in Revelation chapter four and five is we get to see things from heaven's perspective. What I want us to see is there are seven things that John sees when he's taken up to heaven. Uh, the, number one is obviously, and this is what, we, what we've already covered, is the, the rapture. And so here we have what is typified as the rapture of the church where John is taken out. And we can see that the church is removed, if you will, because from chapter four all the way through to chapter 19, the church is never one time mentioned again. Now, you do see, okay, the church, we're going to talk about the church today. You do see the church here in chapter 4 and a little bit in chapter 5, uh, but we see them, they're in heaven, okay? That's where they've gone. So here in the very beginning, John is raptured up into heaven, and that's going to be important for how you interpret the rest of this chapter, because whenever he gets up there, number two, the first thing that he sees is he sees the throne. If you turn in your Bibles over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 10, we'll see why that that is. This is what all of us are going to have to face whenever we are raptured out, what we're going to deal with. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, <clears throat> it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, a lot of times, whenever people think about the judgment, the way that they think about the judgment is that there's just going to be this one big judgment and everyone who's ever lived is just going to stand in line and they come before the pearly gates and then St. Peter decides, you know, if you get in or not, or maybe they have some scales and they're going to weigh out your good deeds and your bad deeds. And if you, the good deeds weigh out, you know, way more than you know, you, they'll let you in. So they think it's just going to be a big line that everyone's standing there just waiting to talk to God or waiting to talk to St. Peter. And of course, that's not the way the Bible describes the judgment whatsoever. In fact, there's actually going to be two separate judgments. Uh, you have what's called the judgment seat of Christ, as talked about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. But once you get all the way past 20, Revelation chapter 20, you have what is called the great white throne judgment. Those are two separate events that happen at two separate times. The judgment seat of Christ happens right after the rapture and everyone at that judgment is a born again believer. And what is being judged there is not whether you get into heaven, that's already been determined if you're a believer. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, then that's already been settled on the cross. You follow with me? But when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, what's going to be judged there is your faithfulness. And then at that judgment, then it's going to be determined what type of crowns that you're going to receive as a reward. Now, at the great white throne judgment that you see in Revelation chapter 20, there, everyone there is going to be lost. And it's not going to be determined whether you get into heaven or not at that judgment either. That's all also already been determined because that was determined by their rejection of the cross. If they've rejected the gospel, then there's no amount of discussion that's going to change that fact once they're already dead and standing before the Lord. What's going to be determined there is going to be their rewards of punishment, right? Because some will be worse than others as Christ talked to the Pharisees and he told them clearly their punishment would be worse than other people's would be. But that's what's going to happen at those two judgments. And you want to make sure that you're going to be at the first one. You want to receive the gospel, receive Jesus Christ, your personal savior. That's when you're taken up with the church. And then you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is exactly what you see happening here. As soon as John is brought up to heaven, he's brought before the throne. And what does he see? The first thing he sees is he sees the glory of God, as you see here. Look at it. He says that he that sat in verse three, that sat upon the throne, he was like to look upon Jasper and a sardine stone. And then there was this huge rainbow around the throne. 
And we're like, well, what does that mean? What that means, if you turn over to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 11, it gives you an idea of what this means or what it is that we're looking at. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 11, it says, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone that was clear as crystal. Do you see? What, it, what he's trying to say is that this, the, the one who is sitting on the throne is shining so bright and the way that he is shining in his glory is like the way that whenever you look at a jasper stone and the way that the light reflects off of it. So he's trying to describe to you the way that his glory is shining. And of course, it was John himself that wrote in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. He says, our God, this is the message which we've told you, our God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And so one of the first things that he sees is the brightness of his glory. But even more specifically, he says, not only does he shine like a jasper stone, but also like a sardine stone. A sardine stone is different because a sardine stone is like a blood red ruby. And so he says, it's not just clear light, but it's, you can see it's like clear, but you see a redness to it. And people debate about what that means, but I think of specifically as the church are all standing before him in this moment, I think it clearly represents the blood of Jesus Christ and the glory of him as our savior standing before his throne. And that's what we're going to see when we are raptured and when we're brought up before the Lord is we're going to become face to face with his glory because that was the reason why we did everything that we did was for his glory. And it also tells us in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 28, it says, talking about specifically the fact that there was a rainbow around him, it says in Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 28, when Ezekiel had a similar vision of the throne room of God, it says that there was the appearance of a bow that is in the cloud on a day of rain, and so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of, of the glory of the Lord. So in other words, this, as, it, as it reflects and shines the way that a, 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 a priceless gem would reflect and shine, it created a rainbow all around him, right? And he's trying to describe to you him seeing the glory of the Lord shining from his throne. But as he sits there and he looks upon this throne, he notices that there's something all around the throne. He doesn't just see what is on the throne. He also see what's, what is around the throne. And he sees 24 elders sitting on 24 seats. So who are these guys? And we can, we can, uh, we can kind of see who they are because of how that they're dressed, right? And uh, the first thing that we can see is that they are wearing robes of righteousness. They're wearing these white robes of righteousness. And so we can see that, first of all, that they are clothed in righteousness, which we see in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10, where Isaiah says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall be joyful in, in God, for he hath clothed me in the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robes of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with, orna with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. Do you see the picture there? Picturing the bride of Christ, picturing the righteousness which is of the saints. And you see that confirmed in Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, where it tells us in no uncertain terms, it says, And to her, talking about the bride, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. See, so that's all, that could only be the church because we're, we're the only ones at this point in the story, we're the only ones who have gotten us. We're the only ones who have been clothed in his salvation. The only ones who have been clothed in those robes of righteousness is the church. And so we see that. Now, people have debated, why is there 24 of them? 
Why are there 24 elders? And there's been a lot of speculation over what that could be. And some people say, well, it represents the church and the fact that there's Jew and Gentile and you have you know, 12 tribes of Israel and you have 12 apostles in the church, you know, all represented, brought together in the church. And, uh, and I, I don't think that that's probably likely. I don't think that that's likely. As we know in the body of Christ, there is neither Jew or Gentile in the body of Christ. Um, nobody really knows for sure why there's 24. Some people speculate when you understand that everything that happened in the temple here on earth was always a reflection of the temple that was in heaven, right? Whenever he told Moses how to build the tabernacle, he says you need to do it after it's a reflection or after the pattern of the true temple that is in heaven. Everything that you see happening down here is always done after a pattern in heaven. Well, down here, when we see the, the, the course that the Levites ran through and also the attendants that the king had, they always ran in a course of 24. There was always 24 of them. And I think that that's probably just the same way that it is in heaven, is they run by a course of 24. And I don't think it's so important to understand why there's 24. I think what we need to understand is that these elders, they represent, they are the leaders, just like those courses of Levites or courses of attendance to the king, these chiefs or elders represented hundreds and thousands behind them. They were representative of a particular group. And so these elders represent the entire body of Christ behind them. So it's not just that he sees 24 guys, but he sees 24 elders who are leaders or chiefs in front of many people that they represent, as we will see later as you come into chapter five. So he sees these elders who represent the entire body of Christ and they're all standing there. They're clothed in this righteousness, but also it says that they have crowns on their head. Here, when we talk about us receiving crowns in heaven, uh, there's five crowns that the Bible talks about that are possible for you when you get there. Now, there may be more that we don't know about. I, I don't know if this is meant to be exhaustive, but just as you go through the scriptures, you see five crowns that are mentioned specifically. Uh, the first one that we see is called the crown of righteousness. This is a possible crown that we can win as a believer if we're faithful. And you find this talked about in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Would you guys turn over there with me? It says, this is when Paul says this famous saying, he says, I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me, what? A crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Uh, this particular crown is given to those who are faithful all the way to the end. The crown of righteousness. Uh, these are people in the context, you can see these are people, they're faithful in the sense that they live, they live for his return. That's the way that they live. Remember we talked about perspective, having the right perspective. These are people that always live with his return in mind. That's what they're living for. And they're faithful in that all the way to the end. To those people, whenever you come before the judgment seat, then this is a possible crown that you could win, a crown of righteousness. There's also what's called a crown of life. Another name for this in the Bible is the martyr's crown. Uh, so just one place that you see over in Revelation chapter 2, in verse uh, 10, it says, For none of those things which thou shalt suffer, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. No, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Obviously, that's, I mean, the context and everything, that's very different than the crown that Paul talked about. Uh, the very different uh, conditions for that crown. Do you see what I'm saying? So not, these crowns are not necessarily all the same. Uh, so this is given to those who endure this type of suffering. You see James talks about this as well, 
that whenever you are tried in your faith, when you kind of come under this type of trial in your faith, when you endure, James 1.12, he says, then you will receive the crown of life. This is for those who lay down their life for Christ. They have this special crown. And I think you would agree with me. They probably deserve a special crown, don't they? Uh, they probably should get one that I don't get, right? At least not yet. Maybe, maybe I'll get that. Maybe, who knows? Maybe I'll be uh, lucky enough to receive that honor. But also you have what's called the incorruptible crown. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25, let's look at that one. It says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So we kind of just take that title. It doesn't give it a title specifically in the passage. We kind of take that title from the word out of the passage itself and call it the incorruptible crown. This is, this is for those, uh, crown is given to those who overcome the temptation of their flesh. Now, we never totally overcome or we never really put to silence our flesh. We never really stop fighting. But what it means specifically is those who have overcome the temptation in this sense that they've not allowed their flesh to cause a bad testimony to disqualify them from the ministry and to disgrace their Lord publicly. They've never allowed their flesh. They've always kept their flesh in subjection so that whenever I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. So they've overcome the flesh in that sense. Then you have this incorruptible crown that is waiting for them. Okay, so you also have what's called the crown of rejoicing. Another word for that or another name for that is the soul winner's crown. You see this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 19. And this crown is very unique. It says, for uh, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. Now, what he could be saying here is he could be saying that you guys being at the throne, th that will be like my crown of rejoicing. Now, he could be meaning that figuratively. You guys are like the, the, the crown that I wear of rejoicing because you're standing before the Lord. And he could mean it literally in the sense that because you're standing before the Lord, I will receive a crown of rejoicing because you are there. But either way, either one would be a tremendously wonderful crown to wear, whether figurative or literal, the fact that you have people in heaven that are there because of you. This is a crown that is given to those who are soul winners. They are the only ones who will have this crown, this specific kind of crown of rejoicing in heaven whenever other people are in the presence of the Lord because of you. Now, sadly, the, there will be some people that will lose this crown because there will be nobody in heaven because of them, because they didn't lead anyone to Christ. They were never a soul winner. So this is, remember, these are all wonderful crowns that you can gain. These are also crowns that you can lose, right? If you allow your flesh to get a hold of you to the point that you're disqualified from ministry. Uh, if you choose, if you're tried in your faith and, and you give in, if you don't stay faithful all the way to the end and live for his return, if, if you're not a soul winner, there's the last one is the crown of glory, which is called the pastor's crown. And that's in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. And he's just saying, if you're a faithful pastor, if you feed your flock, Peter says, if you feed your flock and you lead them by example, and you're faithful in that, then you will receive a crown of glory. There's a special crown, like, much like there's a special crown for martyrs, there is a special crown for pastors. If they are faithful, not only to teach you the word, but also to live the word in front of you, to be an example of the word. That's the reason why whenever John comes before the throne, what does he see? He sees these elders who represent the many behind them. 
and they're clothed in righteousness, which all of us will be because we've accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Like I said, everyone at that judgment is saved, but they're also going to be wearing crowns on their head. Why? Because when he sees them, they've gone through this ceremony, obviously, already, and they've received their crowns. And these crowns are not just rewards, they're also responsibilities. As he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, if you suffer with me, then you will also what? Reign with me. If you've been faithful in little, then you will be faithful in much. Right now is the time for us to prove our faithfulness so that we'll be able to then receive greater responsibility in reigning with him in his kingdom. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go. Okay, so he sees these elders representing the mass of the body of Christ with crowns upon their head and robes of righteousness. But he doesn't just see that. He also sees it surrounded by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. You see this as he says that he sees these seven lamps. Do you see that in the passage? These seven lamps that are there burning before the throne of God. And people are like, what, what, does, what are these seven lamps that are burning before the, the seven spirits, it says? Uh, before the throne of God. Well, just to put your mind at ease, the Bible does not teach that there are seven Holy Spirits. <laughs> There's just one Holy Spirit. And of course, as you can see in the entire context, you're there before the throne. We're seeing the glory of God. You have the elders, robes of righteousness, crowns on their head. And of course, the Holy Spirit would have a major presence here because what is the most unique thing about the church, about the body of Christ? It is the only dispensation throughout the entire Bible where the Holy Spirit has a very specific ministry to the church where he comes into the believer and he makes them born again and he seals them with the Holy Spirit of promise and they're sealed into the day of redemption. That doesn't happen to anybody else in the Bible. That never happens until Acts chapter two. In Acts chapter two, that's when people start getting born again. Nobody before that and then after the church is born again. Totally different thing. They're born again because the Holy Spirit comes and actually indwells us and he seals us with the Holy Spirit of promise. So it's no wonder that as you see the judgment seat of Christ and the implications of that, the Holy Spirit would be prominent there in that because whenever the church is taken out, then that ministry of the Holy Spirit is removed as well. So he is there and you see these seven spirits before the Lord. If you look over in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse two, then we can kind of see what it means by the seven spirits. We can help to explain that. It gives us an understanding. In Isaiah chapter 11 and verse two, it says here, it says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Talking about the Lord when he comes. He says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So it calls it the spirit of the Lord, number one. It says the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Do you see that? It lists all seven. And what this is talking about here is this is talking about the multifaceted ministry of the Holy Spirit when it talks about these seven spirits that are burning before the Lord. It's not saying that there are seven Holy Spirits. It's talking about the multifaceted ministry it, where it is the spirit of the Lord. It is the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, and the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. This multifaceted ministry of the Holy Spirit represented in these seven burning lamps before the Lord. Everybody following with me? That's pretty clear. Yeah. So not only does he see this, but then it gets really weird when you're reading, okay? Because then you're, you're looking at all this and you're thinking, you know, maybe you have questions about how come there's 24 elders? I mean, that's the most bizarre question we've had up to this point. And then all of a sudden there are four beasts and you're like, what? <laughs> why, why are there four beasts before the throne? And you're like, this is so... Wild, and that's one of the things I love about the Bible is that just when you think you've got a handle on it, then you're like, okay, now we've got four beasts to deal with. So what is what are these four beasts about? And there's there's questions about who exactly they are. But one thing that we do know 
about them for sure, is that whenever someone gets a vision of the throne of God, these guys are there. These four beasts around the throne are there. Uh, Isaiah in chapter six, you don't have to turn there, but Isaiah in chapter six, you guys know the scene whenever he had the vision of the Lord. And it says in the year of Uzziah, I died. Uh, when Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple, right? Remember the temple up there, which this one is a reflection of. He had filled the temple and it says, and it stood above the seraphims and each had six wings with twain that it covered their face and twain that covered their feet and twain he did fly. And I think that we should start using the word twain again. That's a good word, isn't it? No? Okay, maybe not. So he cried one to another and they said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts whose, earth, or whose glory fills the whole earth. Say, they're saying the same things that you see these beasts are saying. It says in Revelation chapter four, that night and day, these beasts that are there before him never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. But then you go over to Ezekiel chapter one, okay? Go over there to Ezekiel chapter one, verses four to 10. And, and we don't even have time to touch really the hem of the garment as it were on this passage because it's so mammoth. But when Ezekiel has a vision of the throne room as well, and here he has a vision, these four guys are still there. And, and yet he gives a little bit more detailed description. He says, I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Okay, and just so you know, that's where heaven is. We don't have time to go into the directions of how to get to heaven, but heaven is in the north, right? In the third heaven. It's a literal place. It's not some esoteric state of mind. That's not where heaven is at. It's not just some separate dimension, you know, where weird things, and no, it's a part of the created order. It's, it's in the third heaven, it's north. Okay, so that's just so you know, that's where that comes from. But he says, I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and fire unfolding in itself and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, of the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, and also out of the midst came the likeness of four living creatures. And there was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they, had, and they four had their faces and their wings and their wings were joined to one another and they turned not when they went, they went everyone straight forward. And for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side. And they had four had the face of an ox on the left side and they four also had the face of an eagle. You see, same faces. Now the implication that you get from this passage where it gives you a little bit more information is you find out that each one of them had all four faces of these four faces, okay? And there is a small difference in the sense that in Ezekiel, um, these guys have four wings and in Revelation, they have six, right? And so there do seem to be some differences. In Ezekiel, as it carries on, especially once you get into chapter 10, you find out that these beasts that he's talking about here, uh, here are called cherubim. But whenever Isaiah talks about it, in Isaiah chapter, chapter 6, he calls them seraphim, which we would all think are different kinds uh, of beings uh, in, in heaven. So it's hard to tell if they are cherubim or if they are seraphim. It's hard to tell if they are because there are differences in the descriptions uh, with specifically with regards to how many wings that they have. But what we do know is that these beasts guard the throne and they cease not night and day to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. We know that they do surround 
the throne. But every time that someone has a vision, when Isaiah has it, when Ezekiel has it, and now when John has it, he sees these beasts and they've got this face of a man, of a lion, of an ox, you know, of an eagle. We see them all before the throne, guarding the throne and praising the Lord saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So he sees this and he also sees, number seven, is he sees worship. The four beasts and the elders begin to worship the Lord, as it says in that final passage there of Revelation chapter four, and they start to worship the Lord. And it says that they take their crowns and they cast them before the Lord. And they say this to him in the final verse, they say, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Not only, do you see how it starts? It starts out with his, his throne and his glory. And whenever the chapter finishes, they're saying that everything was made by your pleasure and for your pleasure. Do you see? Those are the two capstones on this chapter. Whenever we get raptured out of here, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're standing before him dressed in the white robes of righteousness. And we see these four beings that are surrounding the throne and his glory shining with blood red, clear crystal light shining forth from him. And we receive the crowns for our, for our faithfulness before him. The reason why we're going to do that and what we're going to be saying is we're all going to take off our crowns and we're going to cast them back to his feet as a gesture to say the reason why we did all of this was for your honor and for your glory, because the only reason why everything was created was by your pleasure and for your pleasure. Now that is the type of perspective that we should have as we move into this new year. That day that we just described, that is the day that we're all looking forward to. That's the day that we're working for.